Emeryville from Cal from California and uh, to Chicago. And it's, you know, you go through five, eight, 10, I don't know how many different environments. You leave Denver, if you go westbound, you leave Denver and it's warm and sunny and you go through the tunnel and there you are in Winters Park and people are skiing and it's 30 degrees colder. But, but here it's just snowing and it's, and it's fun. It was, we've had usually typically in mid-April, we have one more storm just to tell, just to remind us that we're, we live in the North. Yeah. Um, but no, it should be starting to get warmer though, right? With- uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we, our last week was our last record low below zero. <laughs> That's good. If, if that helps. And, and do, and you, then it, do you like the cold weather? I guess you've gotten used to it from like- living. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, we, yeah, we had great cold weather this year because I had, I could, I could ski either if I were real lazy, I could ski out the back door or if I were ambitious, I could ski out the front door and just go all the way around the lake. And we had, we had some days where it was basically skis. You could ski in just long sleeve flannel shirts. It was so warm and uh, mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty it's pretty nice and, and the the, th the only thing around here is the wind if if the wind gets really nasty, which it does in oh, Worthington yeah. I know. It's windy today. <laughs> yeah, it it, it it if it does get windy, it, it's it changes the whole environment. It changes your whole perception of the environment. But hmm. okay, well I think uh, Peter's working on it so that I can share my screen. Um, and yeah, we'll get yeah, see, going. It works that. now. Okay. It says it's still disabled for me, at least. I I changed uh, the settings, um, but it didn't ask me to apply the selection. It seems like it may be done automatically. Um, I'll try leaving and rejoining. Oh, you still cannot share. Okay. Yeah, she'll come. She'll come right back. Uh, I can. I can share. I can see my share is app is oh, okay. applicable. Okay. Well. Well. Um. Yeah. Verse. Uh. Probably my first time meeting Paul. And. Uh, um. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining today. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah. Uh. Yeah. It's great. Great to meet you. Be able to meet you. Now you're, you're muted. I think. Paul. I am. There we oh. go. I've done enough Zoom that I should know better by now, but yeah, <laughs> there, we'll do my cluttered background. <laughs> I have, I have a background right now. Ah. Yeah. Um, it, it still says I can't share it, unfortunately. Oh. Oh. Okay. Let's see what happens here. Uh, so Paul, how long have you been down at uh, Worthington? Uh, this is my ninth year. Yeah, I okay. came in 2012. Okay, because Mark, Eng Mark Engelbretson and I came down there, I think, yeah, probably you, j just before you. Yeah, you would have met with Rick Dalrymple, my pre predecessor. Yeah. Um, I taught at Concordia College in Moorhead for 12 years before I came here. I've heard of that. We, we, I have just way too many covers in my life. <laughs> There's a gusty over here, so we won't. We oh won't no, talk no, about, I, I we won't know. Talk about that at all. No, no, not the gusties or the yes. Olies. God forbid. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're the Olies. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. We came down there, uh, you know, years ago, and, and yeah, saw, saw the setup, and uh, and I and I think I've sent an email to both to you and to, uh, uh, and to Moorhead to say, you know, if you guys need help, uh, I have a system running right behind me right now. And it's, it's running reasonably successfully. We still have a couple things we're unable to do, but I'd be well, happy to. It's it's interesting because I got my undergraduate at Moorhead State or now Minnesota State University Moorhead. Right. Um, and so I was still, um, when I was in grad school at NDSU, I was a volunteer out there for their astronomy programs. Right. Um, and so I knew about these magnetometers before I ever got to, to Minnesota West. Yep. Yeah, and, and then and we do have ultimate ulterior motivation, and uh, all my my wife's relatives are in Canby, 
and oh, Iv- sure. Ivanhoe and all those other kind of places. That's just a suburb of Worthington, isn't it? Well, we well, it's a suburb that's almost 90 miles from here. <laughs> right. Uh, right. We do but have a campus in Canby, though. Right. Yeah, that's my, what West does. My cousin's wife worked at, the, she was the, sorry, I don't know if she's still there, Denise Sick. Oh, Denise. Yeah. I know Denise. Do you? Okay. Yeah. She yeah. Uh, gave me my tour the day I did my interview here almost yeah. 10 years ago now. So yeah, yeah. yeah she works for, she moved over to, um, we have this regional HR thing with us and SMSU and Marshall. Right. Uh, she moved over to that office, I think. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, so uh, all the relatives out there are, are those, these poor farmers with three and 4,000 acre farms. Yeah. You kind of feel sorry for them. It's horrible. You know? So, uh, but D- Denise's husband, Gary, he, uh, he's a, he has a finishing yard for cattle. And so he gets truckloads of cattle and then they eat and get fat and then they truck them away to probably to Sioux Falls for. for oh, com- Sioux com- Falls. Um, and, yeah. Watertown has a big cattle yard. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. We, and, and now the next generation is taking over all these big farms. And so uh, I, you know, you get to see these fancy tractors with all their capability. Yeah. And, and so Josh takes me up in the tractor and says, look at this tractor. I said, Josh, you got a short end of the stick. Where is the coffee maker? Yeah. You know, I mean, what's the, what's set the point the, of, of- Just set the GPS and let it drive you around. Yeah, this, this, one will, this one will change the seed depending on where they are in the field. Most yep. of their fields are pretty uniform, but they do have some lowlands with little, yep. uh, a, a little more lo- loamy soil. And so I, yeah, I complained to Josh that where's the coffee maker? What's the, what's the point of sitting in this thing if, if the coffee maker is, is not running? So yeah, you, uh, these, uh, these tractors are, well, all this equipment now is just incredible. And then the, the, the cousin, his, his dad, Josh's dad is one of these people. He's not a farmer like our farmers up here. He's a real farmer. He's got a, a shed where he, all, the, all the big equipment stays and you could literally eat off the floor. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, he just, you know, we've had, we've had family events with hundreds of people in this place. And you'd never notice that it was filled with you know, tractors and combines and, and skid loaders and all that kind of stuff because you can't see anything on the, on the floor. So, Lexa, you on your market set go, I guess, huh? Yeah, um, I'm ready. Uh, I wasn't. Sure. Well, wait. Yeah, I'll share my screen at least, and so I can view. Then, okay, we're, we're on the starting line. Um, Peter, would you like to get started? Uh, well, yes. Yeah, so, uh, I well, don't know if uh, you have introduced yourself mm-hmm. to Paul. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah. Oh. So, uh, I guess we'll just go into it then. So, yeah. Um, today I'm going to be presenting on you know the Smart Network, and it's going to be a brief introduction to space weather and just kind of what Smart's doing in relation to that. And so self-introduction. I'm Alexa. I'm from San Diego, California, and I'm now a third year at UCLA, and I am majoring in astrophysics with a minor in atmospheric and oceanic sciences, or AOS, and with SMART, I am the project's education and public outreach lead, so I'm in charge of, you know, presenting this and, you know, having you guys get involved and everything that pertains to that, and uh, at UCLA, I'm also involved with uh, Women in the Physical Sciences, which is a uh, student organization that kind of, you know, provides resources and uh, events for uh, other undergraduate students. And I'm also involved with Elf- Elfin, which is a largely uh, student-built, student-ran uh, CubeSat, Cube satellite mission, which uh, is currently, currently, you know, orbiting Earth and is also, you know, looking at the magnetic fields from uh, that perspective. So uh, yeah, that's me and my contacts there if you don't have it yet and you need to reach me. So, yeah. And um, uh, oh, maybe I'll, I'll introduce a little bit about myself. Um, so I, um, uh, so actually I've been working on ground-based magnetometer projects for, for many years, uh, starting from the time when I was a grad student at UCLA and after that, of course, uh, I started to um, 
be involved in uh, uh, projects, uh, similar projects, and also uh, uh, even starting new projects. And uh, I think it was about uh, mid 2000s, I had a uh, fortune to uh, come down to Minnesota to install several magnetometers myself. I think including uh, one um, uh, at a uh, nose uh, uh, station and also um, uh, one at, at Worthington. So I, I so I was, uh, it was a very uh, very nice experience uh, experience for me. And um, so the, these are. Uh, you know, set up by previous projects, but at UCLA we have great interest to to uh, reorganize what we have uh, in the nation. And uh, I think there are about uh, two dozen uh, magnetometer stations uh, built up by different projects, and uh, we uh, are um, uh, reorganizing the locations to uh, uh, you know to be. Uh, to, to, to align with the, the scientific uh, needs and also uh, better serve the community. Um, so uh, why we're, we're having a new project called SMART. And I appreciate that the Noel even has this, a SMART logo, you know, for, for Zoom sessions. <laughs> um, so um, I very much look forward uh, to working with all of you uh, you know, in, in you know the next few years, I'm sure that you know UC, at UCLA, Alexa is the EPO uh, lead. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, uh, Noel has been instrumental in, in helping us with uh, you know all the um, uh, computer control, especially in the last uh, a couple of years. I think uh, Noel has, has been uh, uh, you know, really instrumental uh, in that efforts. But, you know, at UCLA, we have, you know, more and more students joining us. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, we will have uh, a good team, uh, you know, uh, in, in upcoming years to support, uh, you know, operation of ground-based magnetometers in the nation. So, uh, so that's, that's all from me. Um, and Noel, if you want to introduce yourself, even though I know you already were kind of talking, but I guess briefly. Okay, Paul, I retired from Augsburg University uh, in 17. Actually, they changed the name of the school after I left. So there was no trace of my existence before that. Uh, it's now Augsburg University. I worked with Mark Engelbretson and we installed magnetometers uh, all over the Arctic around Hudson Bay in the MAX project. And we also, uh, manage the data for the AGO project, which were the unmanned uh, magnetometer radio receivers and such that were in the Antarctic. And uh, that MAX project continues uh, and is now run uh, by another faculty member. And uh, the AGO project has, has faded away, uh, though it may be reincarnated at some time. Uh, Peter put the uh, magnetometer for what was then called the Falcon magnetometer array in 2009, I believe, in my front yard, and it was using a PC. And I think you, you do you still have the PC that that came with that? Uh, we, we, yeah, yeah. we, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. You're asking Paul. Yeah, so then, oh. uh, as part it's... of the project, someone rebuilt that with the BeagleBone single, uh, you know, little mini computer, microcomputer. And then I just took the code and moved it on over to the Raspberry Pi, uh, primarily because of a lot of experience with the Raspberry Pi, though I still have the Beagle Bone here and still have all the software and it works, it works fine either way. So our system worked along um, until about three years ago when uh, the UCLA no longer hosted the data collection. Uh, we continue to collect the data, the data is just being kept on a, a drive here, as well as I have a network of attached uh, storage system that uh, downloads that data. So there's a, a backup to it. And uh, so we have a, a Raspberry Pi running here. And uh, between a couple of students and myself, uh, we've gotten uh, a, a new version of the software that basically does the same thing. It reads data flowing in from the magnetometer. 
Now, in addition to that, because of the limited avail availability of new magnetometers, uh, I've also started using these IC magnetometers that are available. And we found a couple that are fairly appropriate. Uh, they don't have anywhere near the resolution of what the search or the uh, flux gate magnetometer that's buried at Worthington or buried here. They don't have anywhere near that uh, resolution and quite a bit noise here. But we have there have been some groups that have gotten them running fairly effectively. So that's what I do. Um, I'm up here uh, running uh, all sorts of uh, projects with Raspberry Pis and now all the other microcontrollers that are available. I'm building uh, ham radio stuff as well as uh, electronic stuff for uh, for things like APRS, which is a, a location yeah. service. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll get into a little more detail about my stuff. Uh, it, uh, and our graph and our uh, magnetometer stuff uh, once uh, Alexa has finished. Thanks. By, by the way, Casey zero NSR. That's my call sign. <laughs> you know, I think I, I think I looked you up just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was just on this after I've, I've built a new CW keyer out of uh, another microcontroller, and uh, it uses touch uh, control because I'm too cheap to buy one of those really nice keys. So anyway. Yeah, we'll talk more about that. Okay, great. Um, so there's some landscaping happening outside of where I am right now. So let me know if it's uh, very distracting. It gets too loud and I'll try to switch rooms. But uh, yeah, okay. So great to hear from everybody. Uh, welcome, Chris. Uh, you've just missed. So we, we have uh, Chris join, just joined. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, hi. Uh, so yeah, I guess we can do really brief run through again, but I'm just Alexa. I'm a uh, third year at UCLA and I'm the smart uh, education and public outreach lead. And I'm gonna be leading the presentation on space weather and then hey, Peter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm uh, Peter Chi, I'm a, a research scientist at UCLA. And uh, I think a uh, ground-based magnetometer is uh, one of my, um, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, most favorite topics and uh, I'm, I'm the PI of the project uh, uh, um, called SMART. Uh, now, now it's the reorganization of uh, all previous uh, ground-based magnetometer stations here in the United States, including um, uh, Themis uh, EPO stations uh, and McMag and Falcon stations. So, um, so I'm, I'm so work work with all you know the the, the nice folks at UCLA uh, supporting you know this uh, new organized uh, network. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and get into the presentation then. So um, where do we start? And uh, this presentation on space weather and uh, some of you guys, you know, might have familiarity to some degree with uh, the topics that we discussed, but, uh, you know, we need to start with space weather basically deals with magnetic fields of the earth and the sun and interaction. And you'll find out they have magnetic fields, but you know, what is magnetic field? I guess it's the basic principle you should establish. And it's any uh, object that's a magnet or an electric current or a changing electric field produces a magnetic field, which is basically a field of force that uh, is a vector field in the sense that has direction to it. And uh, this field can be re represented by continuous lines uh, that emerge from the North Pole. All magnets have a North Pole and a South Pole, and they'll emerge from the North Pole, terminate at the South Pole. And you can get an idea for the strength or intensity of the magnetic field by the density of the lines or the closeness together of the magnetic field lines. And uh, yeah, by seeing the lines, you just get an idea of you know, the directionality of it. And uh, you know, magnets are type of things that you, know, you have in your fridge. And when you have an MRI, you, know, you get kind of this idea of them in your everyday sense, but they play a, a role on a much larger scale when we look at space weather. So um, space weather is basically the magnetic, you know, interactions and interplay between the Earth and Sun. And if you did not know, now you know the Earth has a magnetic field. And it's actually very important to, you know, everything that goes on the Earth. And uh, if you've ever taken, you know, a planetary science class or, you know, probably some familiarity, the Earth has uh, different internal layers. And we have a liquid core and inside the liquid core, there's this constant convection and rotation and conduction 
And through um, a process known as the geodynamo or the geodynamo effect, it causes through this convection, the earth to produce a magnetic field that um, surrounds it uh, with, you know, the exact same idea as, you know, a basic kitchen magnet, you have a north and south pole and, um, you know, we can draw lines around the earth to represent it. And the sun as well, uh, I feel like it's a little lesser known, but also has these distinct layers with uh, different specific properties and features. And uh, there's, you know, radiative zone, convective zone, and there's the exact same processes of convection and uh, rotation happening that produce the magnetic field. And of course the sun, uh, you know, the very nature of the sun, it's obviously much, much larger than the earth, but it's also a star as opposed to a planet. And the processes happening inside of it are much more uh, intensive and powerful. So the magnetic field accordingly is, you know, much more extensive and influential, and it reaches the very edges of our solar system, interacting with all the planets uh, that it comes in contact with. So every planet in the solar system, you know, feels the effects of the sun's magnetic field. And this magnetic field, uh, I guess, effectively, the way we kind of measure its uh, impact is through the solar wind. And the solar wind is this constant stream of radiation and plasma and plasma being you know, charged particles like electrons and protons that's flowing out of the sun and the magnetic field lines uh, kind of flow along the solar wind plasma. Uh, while the solar wind plasma you know, is attached to the magnetic field, they're kind of bound together in this very fundamental way uh, physically. And yeah, so the sun's in this constant state of you know, dynamic production of the solar wind. And I think it's very easy to you know, take for granted uh, looking at the sun every day, oh, it's constant, dis distant uh, thing that might be powerful and obviously it warms our planet, but you know, it's not really having anything happen. And the sun constantly is going through uh, these sort of insane, you know, uh, processes producing all this uh, activity on its surface and inside that produces the magnetic field. Uh, so like here we have, you know, solar flares and such, and uh, it it's produced through these exact same principles of magnetism that, you know, we talked about earlier. Uh, so yeah, the magnet magnetosphere of the Earth is the region surrounding the Earth where the dominant magnetic field is the Earth. And this region is defined by constantly uh, buffeting against the solar wind and inter interplanetary magnetic field, which is, uh, at least in our region, mostly defined by the solar wind. And uh, in a lot of ways, it acts as like a shield or a bubble, and it insulates us from the most severe effects that would be caused by the solar wind if we did not have it, um, you know, stripping us of our atmosphere. Uh, these effects that occur on other plants that do not produce magnetic fields because of their internal structure, and you can see the difference. And, you know, we have an illustration of the kind of structure of the magnetic field, and that it's, it's a pretty complex uh, large entity, you know, if you think of relative Earth, it expands multiple Earths outside of us and uh, it's very, you know, important to the Earth. Uh, so yeah, this video kind of shows that uh, it visualizes the way that the magnetosphere and magnetic field is, you know, in constant motion, constantly buffeting against the solar wind. And uh, at the end, you know, this is known as the day side and the night side. And the solar wind comes from this uh, direction and you know pushes against it, shaping it backwards. And it's the formation of a whole uh, what's known as a magneto tail. And you can see there's kind of this very uh, not constant or you know changing severity of the way we feel the solar wind, depending on you know its speed and uh, such. So uh, now we get the basic idea of space weather, where it's the our magnetic field interacting with the sun's magnetic field and solar wind. Uh, so what you know, what effect does this really have? You know, why why does it matter? Well, uh, when the solar wind you know gets very active, it and other you know solar features occur. We have what are known as geomagnetic storms. So we can kind of think about this just like regular weather. Uh, there's certain periodic cycles and then more intensive short-term events. So, you know, we have summer where it's warmer, winter where it's colder, and there might be a rainy season. And then, you know, but then there's hurricanes, which we can predict to some extent, but they're a lot less constant 
a lot more uh, powerful. Exact same thing applies with uh, geomagnetism and space weather, where uh, the solar wind, you know, kind of has like an average constant uh, effect, which is much different than you know normal wind. It's going 100 million miles per hour, but uh, which is obviously, you know, seems like a large number, but it's just kind of constantly being deflected by the Earth. And uh, the high speed winds can indicate, you know, more likeliness of geomagnetic storms. Well, you know, when it's slower, it's a bit more calm. And, you know, this is constant, the constant from the uh, sun. Uh, this video, I think is really cool because it shows, you know, decades of the sun producing the solar wind in all directions. And it's, you know, constantly space weather effects, just like, you know, weather around us, even when there's not like a storm outside, you know, climate's affecting things. The solar wind is constantly in some being produced and interacting with our Earth, and this is over. Um, I think it's a really cool video if you ever want to watch it in full, and it's on YouTube. But it goes through you know decades of just this activity, and you can see in the background objects passing by, like comets and such. Let me escape. So, um, but beyond the solar wind, there are more distinct uh, phenomena. Why is this not? Sorry. Uh, so, one second. Uh, so there are what are known as solar flares, which are these sun large eruptions of electromagnetic radiation from the sun. Uh, and these outbursts of energy are very uh, fast reaching the earth in about eight minutes. And then there are coronal mass ejections, uh, no CMEs, which are uh, large expulsions of plasmatic coronal material uh, with magnetic field frozen in. And these are uh, you know, distinctly different in the way they're produced and the effect they have on Earth. And usually these are a bit slower in the travel time, taking a few days to reach Earth. And this video kind of, I think, just has a good uh, visualiza visualization of uh, these types of events. And it shows the differences between solar flares and coronal mass ejections. And uh, once again, I just think it's really very insightful to see how you know constant and you know large these events are, uh, and the sun just in a very active state with uh, such uh, processes occurring, you know, constantly. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what are the consequences of these storms? Well, our magnetic field is kind of this boundary with outward space and it, in space, you know, we have satellites and, uh, you know, the way our GPS depends on functioning is, you know, through communication, through these signaling. So, uh, you know, a lot, of, basically most of the technology today depends on this type of uh, very interconnected communication with devices across the globe. So when uh, these storms happen, they disrupt and disturb our magnetic field in a way that, the communication is very much uh, distorted, for instance. So uh, when there's these storms, you know, there's satellite and GPS disruption, which affects, you know, phones, cars, scientific equipment, there can be radio blackouts, and it can produce uh, what is known as geomagnetically induced currents. And these are uh, caused by when coronal mass ejections and other disturbances cause Earth's field to rattle. And basically, it causes these induced currents to form through electromagnetic induction and they'll flow through railroad tracks, underground pipelines, electric power grids, basically anything that functions in essence larger when we have these currents going and cause extensive blackouts and power system uh, disruption or even damage uh, to you know whole grids and such. And it's it's a very uh, prominent issue that uh, a lot of the times has to be considered when uh, putting these things into place. And yeah, this kind of just shows the whole way the current flows because uh, everything's connected in these ways uh, that it, you know, can cause power plants and transformers to go out very quickly. Um, so right here, just kind of a summary of these effects and the way that, uh, you know, networks and everything's connected that when we have these disturbances from uh, solar events, that cause a uh, distinct anomalous space weather to occur. You have disruption here, and then you know it 
creates the ge geometrically induced currents, it affects satellite uh, functioning, uh, GPS, and all these things that are involved in our everyday lives, but we may not realize. And I think one way to really get a grip of how uh, pressing these effects are is the 1859 Carrington event, which was from the first to second of September 1859. Uh, it's known by at least one major chronal mass ejection directly impacted Earth. And if you remember, usually chronal mass ejections take at least one or two days to reach Earth. This one took uh, only about 18 hours. And there was widespread disruption to electrical and telegraph surfaces. And it created auroras visible in the tropics. And if you have any familiarity with uh, auroras, you know, you know, like northern and southern lights, they're usually at the poles. So these reach all the way down to the tropics. And today, a Carrington class event would cause between 0.6 to 2.6 trillion damages uh, in the US alone, and you know, major blackouts, power grid destruction, uh, equipment failures, it would have very severe effects and impact. And uh, Carrington class events are thought to be only, you know, happening, you know, every once in a few millennia. But uh, in 2012, there was a Carrington class event that by only a few days missed Earth. So even though it is a very kind of novel, severe event, it's not totally out of the reality that could happen again. And these are the type of things that we'd like to be prepared for. Uh, this right here just shows if you remember the previous video of the way magnetic fields affected, and then we have the Carrington event, basically a simulation, and you can just see how severely it shaped and impacted the magnetic field of Earth. So, yeah. Um, auroras are also caused by geomagnetic storms and space weather, and basically electrons are energized uh, in the magnetic field through acceleration processes, and uh, in the polar regions, they collide with particles in the upper atmosphere, uh, and they excite these atom atoms that, uh, like oxygen and nitrogen, into higher states. And when they fall back down, they release this energy as light, creating these uh, very magnificent auroral displays. So uh, usually, it forms two ovals, approximately center of the magnetic poles, the way it travels. And larger, more frequent storms will cause them to extend uh, equatorward uh, towards the center of the Earth, and that's why you know the Carrington event caused. Uh, you know, auroras at the tropics. Here we have uh, like a video that kind of just shows uh, on the night side when there's reconnection of the magnetic field lines, it will uh, cause the aurora to kind of travel up to the poles. And I'll show right here. And we kind of see it occurring. And I think this is a cool video just showing, you know, the roars as seen from outer space and that it's not just this kind of visual illusion that we see, you know, from the ground, it's a very much real occurrence of a magnetic field interacting with particles in the atmosphere and creating very physical events. Um, if whoever is unmuted would mind muting, that'd be great. Uh, so just in terms of, you know, now that we understand space weather in the magnetic field, how do we measure it with SMART's involvement? Um, the SMART magnetometer array encompasses a collection of 14 magnetometers, uh, magnetometer systems located across the U.S. at locations such as your guys's and, uh, Basically, they record the field activity, a uh, magnetometer device that measures the average magnetic field in that specific location. And uh, we're detecting specifically the field strength at the Earth's surface. So uh, by measuring the magnetic field through, you know, ground magnetometers, you have to gain insight into uh, space weather activities and magnetic seismic events that are occurring from kind of the perspective of the surface. Uh, Magnetometer readings uh, usually can be split into the directional components. We have X, Y, and Z directions. And uh, measurements, you know, are in, you know, nanoteslas, microteslas. And a lot of magnetometers record temperature as well, just to get insight into the way temperature influences readings. And if there's, you know, uh, temperature related effects on the magnetic field. And uh, just like in the previous slide, this is kind of an illustration of the real-time data that uh, SMART's collecting. This is from Noel's uh, 
currently running my ontometer, this is the whip motion. And you just see like the space will events that occur, the, you know, this is basically it in terms of the numbers, the way it affects the magnetic field. And there is a lot of clearly, you know, data, real data is like not always, you know, the cleanest or prettiest, and it's more just getting the general idea of things. And this is for the exact same day, but with different magnetometers, we also see how, you know, devices have different ways of measuring things and different uh, air factors and such. And that's a lot, a large part of, you know, having a magnetometer array is kind of comparatively looking and uh, through multiple different types, you know, seeing the way things behave. And so the general process that uh, the smart network is using is, you know, we implement a magnetometer set up at stations and schools. Uh, after you know testing the magnetometer, make sure it works, and then the magnetometers are you know collecting the data, and then after that we have analysis where we you know making sure to publish the data online so people can see it, but we also want to calibrate and adjust the magnetometers to best and most accurately measure the data, and then we're you know looking at the actual science, looking for the trends, and to understand you know when events occur. So then uh, magnetometer insights include um, establishing the nominal behavior of the field and it depends on locality. Uh, then looking at you know anomalous magnetic activities so when there's like storms and serious events obviously the magnetic field is going to change it's going to become more uh, severe and then also understanding uh, the way magnetic information and uh, forces you know arrive on the ground depending on where we're at and what the type of event is and all these help us to more accurately and powerfully predict future solar activity in space weather. So uh, with readings by magnetometers such as those with SMART we are able to make things like uh, the U.S. World Magnetic Model, which kind of just gets the general idea of, you know, was the normal way we see magnetic fields acting, you know, across the globe. Uh, so yeah, just to show some real insights from magnetic rings. And that is uh, all for my presentation. So if there are any questions, and then here we have, uh, this is our main site. We have a Twitter that we're hoping to use to uh, inform the public and keep everybody updated on smart uh, findings and other things. And then uh, Noel's site for all his data so far. So yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexa. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, w welcome uh, questions about uh, Alexa's presentation, especially considering that uh, uh, when when you uh, run the uh, UCLA magnetometers at your stations, uh, you might want to, um, uh, you know, involve uh, some students or uh, 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 you know, or edu uh, out outreach efforts. Um, so um, I think uh, Alexa's uh, presentation covers the uh, general scientific topics that may be relevant. Um, for, for that purpose. And uh, after that, we will have Noel to, um, uh, to introduce uh, his personal uh, space weather uh, measurements um, at, you know, at, at, you know, at his location. So, um, uh, and uh, Noel is gonna describe more about you know, the, the small IC sensors, um, uh, not necessarily the, the not not only the UCLA magnetometers, but other uh, smaller sensors. So, uh, but perhaps at, at this point, maybe if you have questions uh, on the general science, maybe you know Alexa can help with that, or the small sensors questions. Maybe we'll wait for a nose presentation. Um, okay. So so what. When we move uh, to Noel, and Noel, uh, you can project your slides. Right. Let me turn myself on here. Um, let's see. I am. I am making noise. Good. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Good. <clears throat> good afternoon. So, in the field of magnetic field detection, uh, we need to do many, 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 many samples. And I think we're sort of like the weather business was a hundred years ago, or maybe even further than that. We had all these individual sites where we could measure the pressure and the temperature and the wind, and we didn't know how they were all related. 
And so one of the big efforts that's being made, that's attempted to be made is to try to uh, understand the relationship. So when we have a magnetometer, we, we want to create an array of magnetometers. Now you could create an array of satellites. Satellites are reasonably expensive to maintain and they will only give you a point sample. So that's one of the reasons why we have satellites that are out there. Uh, they're giving us the idea of what the solar wind is, but they're not giving us a, a complete uh, array of what's going on. So, so we have two magnetometer systems we're talking about here today that might be a little bit confusing. Uh, the first magnetometer array uh, is a, a, a high sensitivity flux gate magnetometer that's buried in the ground uh, at each one of your sites. Mine is, uh, there's a 70 foot hill down to the lake and mine's halfway down the lake to the lake uh, buried in a PVC pipe about three, four feet in the ground. And that's a reasonably sensitive one. So let me start sharing my screen here and then find out uh, here. Okay, well, we'll get to something here. And that magnetometer that's being shared, uh, yeah, here's, here's a little better instrument, uh, is, uh, measuring the magnetic field of a flux gate measures the absolute value of magnetic field here in Minnesota. So uh, the, the total magnetic field strength typically at this part, point uh, in the earth's surface is about 60,000 nanotesla. And in our case, and you saw that on a graph that sort of passed quickly, almost all, uh, we had uh, our North magnetic pole points almost exactly to the true North Pole. So this is where everyone should live uh, because then your com compasses don't get confused. Um, and then someday I'll quiz you all on how you correct a compass. But uh, the, our compass is almost exclusively pointed towards the real North Pole. Uh, and so here we have the three uh, magnetometer, see if I can slide that up a little bit for you. Uh, the three axes of um, the magnetometer. Now this is a magnetometer that's been in the ground uh, about 12 years down here. Uh, it is, uh, I'll show you some of the details of how it works, but it is very sensitive magnetometer. It's temperature compensated and it's in the ground far enough that it doesn't wiggle from the wind. So you can see the X value, uh, which is the horizontal value essentially of the field, which is the north-south field is about 20,000 nanotesla. The Z value, which is the up-down value, is uh, about 50,000 nanotesla. And the Y value is about 1,000 nanotesla because it's, we're almost aligned perfectly. And there's no real way to align these exactly, uh, but our uh, declination is almost zero. So this is live data coming in now. I'll show you how this data gets here. And this is uh, data displayed on the cloud. And the cloud in this case is a company called Adafruit that makes a simple cloud interface. I just keep feeding it data every minute. And you notice the graph will actually move if you keep an eye on it. It's getting a new piece of data every minute uh, for all four of these graphs. Uh, and that's part of our uh, the uh, smart effort is to make it so that the data are universally available. So this is the magnetic field that, is, uh, that, that, that we are measuring. Typically the swings are on the order and you can see, uh, well, let's see, pick a good one. Uh, the Z magnetic field ranges from 51,102 to 51,116. So that's only 14 nanotesla. So if you want to see this data, you have to have an instrument that's quiet enough to be able to see one nanotesla changes and, and not be overwhelmed by noise. Uh, most of the magnetic detectors that you have, such as the one in your car that tells you you're going northeast, west, and south uh, is 100 times noisier than this. And you would not see these fine detail. But this is, this is typical magnetic field. So it's a quiet day. We're coming out of the bottom of the solar cycle. So this is a, a very quiet day. Um, 
here is the same data now reported on a uh, through the Raspberry Pi itself. It looks almost the same. Uh, I've got it, it's not in the same order, unfortunately. I put them in the wrong order. So 20,000 X, uh, 1,000 Y, and 51,000 Z. And this is what the flux gate that is part of the Falcon system is able to, to see. Now, one of the things that we've been trying is looking at other integrated circuit magnetometers. So these integrated circuits are literally the size of a small integrated circuit. Uh, there's a number of them out there. And uh, to give you an idea of what they measure, uh, we did uh, show, uh, Alexa did show, show one of the, this is data from one of those. Now notice the noise is the jumps up and down. And you can see there's some trend, we could average this out, but there's some trend. It's still 20,000 uh, for X, which actually is down to 14,000 and that's my dog's fault. He tripped over the magnetometer. And then Z is about 51,000 and Y is about, in this case, 7,000. So we can shift it around. But this is the present technology for IC magnetometers. This magnetometer, uh, what it does is it takes the magnetic field, puts it through a permeable material and changes the frequency of an oscillator. And then the oscillator is converted back into magnetic field. So this is technology that's available. These sensors are a hundredth of the cost of the flux gate that we have measured here. We do know that the detector that is used by this actual instrument is quite a bit more sensitive and quieter than this. The instrument has some internal averaging and things that go on. And so we're working on this. So what this second magnetometer allows us to do is for far less money, build a magnetometer, uh, a, a magnetometer system. Okay, so uh, th that, that is the, the data that's, that's available. Now I'm going to come out of screen share for a second. And I am going to go to show you the hardware that's involved here in just a second, which I meant to put it up on the screen, but I forgot. And uh, uh, so uh, what, what's involved with one of these machines, one of these devices uh, is, uh, here I found it, is a, a, a detector uh, out on the, uh, let me find you a, yeah, okay. There we go. Uh, sorry, I, I should have opened this up for you, but I'll be right back to you in a, just a second. I gotta open up PowerPoint and then let PowerPoint share. This is where you need about six computers to make this happen. So I'll just show you the basic uh, schematic of what we're doing and uh, how, how these are all hooked up. None of this equipment is very expensive. Uh, typically what we're trying to do is keep the cost in the two, $300 range, uh, even, with this, even with the detectors. Uh, the detectors are probably $25 if we can use this what's called the wit motion or what's called the RM3100. And I don't know what's going on, but it, it'll, it'll come up. And the Raspberry Pi being $45 and uh, peripherals and things like that, we're trying to, trying to keep it on that, on that order. So hopefully something will happen here, maybe not. I don't know. Um, but I'll go back, to the, go back to the meeting here. Uh, I'm not sure why the, yeah, and Paul, our magnetic declination is less than a half a degree here in Eastern Minnesota. So we have that advantage is you can actually line up the magnetometer without even knowing where you, you know, where real true North is. So that didn't happen. Oh, my apologies. Uh, I, okay, I got a way around that problem too. Um, let's see if I can get something to open up here. I will just show you, I, I show you the, the basic outline of the system here. Oh, here we go. Okay. 
Now it woke up. Um, I tried to put all these graphics into a PowerPoint so that I could scan through them, but obviously PowerPoint doesn't like having Zoom running at the same time. Uh, but we'll we'll get to we'll get to that point in just a second. Um, so uh, seconds. Let me say something while we're waiting for PowerPoint. Maybe it'll open up. Uh, is uh, additionally we do store the data locally, and one of the questions we had is how do we make sure it gets stored locally as well as available uh, to the outside world. So in this case, we have we can put the data on a Google storage on, on their uh, Google display Google storage system and display it with Google. And uh, and on the other thing we can do is we can send it to some of these other uh, cloud systems such as the Adafruit cloud. The Adafruit cloud does not store it long term, but it makes it available and it allows you immediately to look and see if the data are, cor are correct. The data is working. This is why Microsoft products are impressive, aren't they? You can waste a significant portion of your life. Uh, while we're wait <laughs> waiting for Microsoft to start up, uh, I don't know what's going on here. I'm sorry, uh, maybe, Hello. Maybe we can. Uh, yeah, you, you want to take you want to talk about something else for a little bit, and then I'll call you back when I when I can get my graphics to start. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Maybe what uh, it it'll be helpful if, if we just uh, ask uh, uh, Paul and Chris and see if you know you have some questions for the UCLA team uh, about you know you know. Uh, operating the manometer or maybe something that you had thought about what uh, UCLA could could uh, do for you. And uh, um, I think uh, Chris uh, was on a, a Themis project. Uh, um, so I, I didn't have, you know, I didn't inter uh, directly interact with you beforehand, but um, just now I think all the UCLA teams are, are, are together. I'm just, uh, uh, the person, uh, you know, the, the main contact person, but I think all the uh, people from previous projects are still, uh, uh, you know, at UCLA, for example, uh, Basilis Angelopoulos and uh, Chris Russell uh, are, are uh, there. Uh, and I, I, I'm still working closely with them and see if uh, there's any uh, thing that the, you hope that the new operation uh, will will, will uh, take place and you know so that uh, that will help your school and, and universities uh, better. I don't really have any questions. Um, I guess other than I may have questions on setting up the equipment, but maybe not. Um, are we keeping the magnetometer that's out there now? Um, I'm unclear if it still works because I haven't even been able to boot up that old computer now. Mm -hmm. um, it worked a couple of years ago, although I noticed that the Z-axis had gone flat. And I have no idea if that's on the computer end or if that's in the cabling. The cabling is still running underground. Right. Um, so I guess most of my questions are, are um, hardware-based. Mm -hmm. And then when we get it running, I'll see what I can do to actually uh, incorporate it into my classes. Yes. Okay. I'm in the same position here because I, I don't know if it's uh, still capable of accepting data from the magnetometer. The computer system also hasn't been running for a while. They converted the alternative high school where it was housed into a wrestling facility, but the computer gear is all in a uh, closet, so that really hasn't been messed with, as far as I know. But, uh, it's going to take a little work to make sure it all's up and running again, if that's what we're doing. Yes. Okay. So I can first uh, briefly answer, and um, Noel may add uh, later. That is the, of course, the the old computer system use was a, a Windows XP uh, desktop, so that is apparently outdated, and what. Uh, at UCLA, what we have been doing is to uh, you know work with Noel because he has uh, 
has ported all the software into Raspberry Pi, you know, it's a very small single board computer. So, and Noel has tested uh, at his station uh, successfully and at UCLA it is, you know, the students are, are you know, uh, at, at this very moment are working on the, the lab test to make sure that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, they are able to repeat, you know, what Noel has uh, successfully uh, done. Uh, but I think, of course, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, uh, actually we had a meeting yesterday and the things have been working properly. So, uh, so basically, you know, what we're going to do is to supply you with the, this new Raspberry Pi unit that can replace the, the desktop PC. So when you hook it up, uh, you are going to see, uh, you know, data flowing in. If all the other other hardware uh, is, is still intact, uh, but uh, you know, from our experience, that we have contacted other uh, stations, and it seems like um, they, you know, could even restart the Windows XP and seeing the data coming in. Uh, so that happens uh, has happened to uh, many other stations. So, so I think there's a, a very good chance that after you switch to uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, you know this the, you know the system is is going to start uh, taking data again. And at UCLA, we're going to also uh, uh, build build up the uh, data system. So uh, you know there there are multiple students who are working on this right now with. Uh, uh, knows uh, advice so that uh, then uh, you, there there will be a a, a data uh, base in the data center on the web for you to access and see the data. So that that's the right. Yeah, yeah. Peter, I can talk about on this. Yeah. So yeah, if you look at your magnetometer, there's a wire coming in, and there's a black box that the magnetometer and the uh, GPS is connected to. Um, that black box has, a, unfortunately, a number of different uh, series or a, a number of different versions which have been created. And the first thing we would have to do is look at the black box. You have to see which version it is. But the black box and the magnetometer should stay just as they are. And they feed through the USB serial port both the GPS data as well as data from the magnetometer itself. I, I have things running, believe it or not. I know. It's still the same year, but I actually I got it going. And so you will keep that. Now, as far as uh, the computer system, the computer system from the black box on will be uh, re-replaced. And that, that is our hope. So let me share this screen and just show you what we are going to provide. And let's see if we can make this happen here. It's a, uh, this is the, the system that we hope will go, it's gonna expand itself. Uh, and these, these, I can send you these images as well. Uh, the magnetometer that you own is on the lower left-hand corner of this image. The electronics box um, is located at the bottom and that's the little black box. And that had the GPS connected to it before we are not necessarily going to connect the GPS again. Uh, the GPS that you had, uh, unfortunately, had the week error in it, in that they didn't, they, they counted up the weeks up to 2096, whatever it was, then it rolled back to, to 1970. And uh, so we uh, will not use the GPS that may be installed at your location. Uh, we can provide additional GPS receivers. And so you see up in the upper left-hand corner, a new GPS receiver goes into the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi has a time standard system built into it that takes in GPS and synchronizes it down to the one pulse per second uh, information that comes in over GPS. It, it, I have outlined in green there, so those two items uh, as sort of optional. And then uh, to the right now, you'll have a power, the same power supply that's hooked up to your interface box, to your magnetometer electronics box, a power supply coming into the Raspberry Pi itself. And then uh, 
uh, above the Raspberry Pi, we're going to provide a touchscreen, a seven inch touchscreen keyboard and mouse so that you can interact with the Raspberry Pi directly right there. And that's where you should be able to see the data coming in. One of the first pieces of code that we have up and running uh, very successfully is just the ability to watch the stream of data come in off the magnetometer electronics. Uh, and so that, that's what you'll have. Now, uh, all of these, you can see uh, the touchscreen and the keyboard and the mouse give you a direct connection. Uh, and then uh, Ethernet will provide you with uh, program updates. Also, you can get the timestamp off of net network time protocol on the internet, which I'm sure most of you.